Okay, so we'll go back to another video. So I'm sure that we know that obviously we were to plug this in the calculator, we have that pi to the e is strictly less than e to the power i, which of course is true if you want to, you know, input that um, those calculations in. So suppose that we're not, of course, given that sort of advantage, um, those, you know, technology, for example. So what are we going to do is we're actually going to go over two different proofs. One is the most standardized proof that I'm sure that no matter if you try to look up the following for this proof, that that's definitely how you see it. And then the second proof is that I feel like this is a more interesting take is more on the visual perspective. So with that out of the way, of course, this act, the, the standardized proof for in general, the, the generic, I'll call it that, is that can be applied for the same thing for um, when you do a bunch of number comparisons specifically. You can also do this to compare the square root of 2 um, is uh, less than the square root or the cube root of 3. That's actually from the Cambridge University um, entrance exam question follows from that. So anything kind of similar to that is a, you know, a good starting way to compare the two numbers in between sort of, you know, take on that. So with that, why don't we actually just jump right in? So let's suppose that for our first proof that we're going to call our function f of x. We'll let that be the following. We'll let that be net the natural log of x divided by x. So if we want to, of course, know what that graph looks like. So without the calculator, we would have to find where it's increasing and decreasing. So that was where we would have to find the first derivative. So if I take the first derivative, then it means that's applying the quotient rule. So that means I have the derivative of ln of x, then n times x, and then subtract with ln of x multiplied by the derivative of x, which is just one, all being divided by x squared. So if I simplify this out, what we have that this is just going to be 1 subtract ln of x, then divided by x squared. Okay, so with that, our derivative, so now let's set that equal to 0 to find where in between our critical points are increasing and decrease, decreasing. So with this in mind, so set this equal to 0, then that means set this equal to uh, 1 minus ln of x divided by x squared. That implies that this is going to be 1 minus ln of x is simply just going to equal 0. And then if I solve for x by itself, that means subtract the 1. So I have the negative ln of x equals negative 1. And then I just divide the negatives to both sides. And so what we have is that ln of x is equal to 1. And if you solve for x, you just take the e base of both sides. Then that means that x is going to be equal to e. So e is our critical point for the following over here. Okay, so uh, that out of the way, so now let's actually uh, put this back, let's put this back into our, uh, our f prime of x function and see that if we test out some numbers, so I have that if we're gonna let um, e be the bigger number, so that means x is uh, gonna be less than or equal to e, so that actually, if you plug it in, so if you plug the numbers less than e, or equal to, rather, I'll, we'll say less than, strictly less than, then that has to imply that this is actually going to be greater, strictly greater than 0 for x uh, less than or equal to e, or rather, I'll put this as um, subtracting the equal sign, so it's just x uh, strictly less than e. So implying that this is actually going to be monotonically increasing, and then now moving on to our f prime of x for the opposite direction. So that means if it's going to be less than zero, if it's going to be less than zero, then that means that that has to imply that that's for all um, x that's going to be strictly greater than e, implying that this is going to be monotonically decreasing. Okay, and so with this in mind, so we know that e is, of course, less than three and then that's going to be less than pi, then if we actually just put in back those functions for pi and e into our, you know, regular function f of x, so that has to imply that f of pi is going to be strictly less than f of e, then putting this back into the function, so I have that ln of pi and then divided by pi is going to be less than ln of e divided by e, okay? And then now if we just solve this out, let's see, I just multiply the pi to both sides, so that means now what I have that this is actually going to be n. And same thing for e too. So I have e ln of pi is less than pi ln of e. And then that also implies that if you actually just take the um, natural log properties and put that back into the um, exponent from here. So that means that, and then also take the e base just to get rid of the natural log. So we have that this implies that pi to the power e is actually going to be strictly less than e to the power i or e to the power pi. 
So that actually concludes the one proof, that generic proof that you know everybody talks about, that slash well really everybody knows about. So let's now actually move on to the visual part. And this actually involves with yet again another function that we have to uh, graph out, not the natural log of x, but instead what we're using is f of x is equal to one divided by x. So let me actually sketch this out over here. So what we have is our x and y axis, and we're actually looking at this for the positives, of course. So y here, then zero. Our function, um, one divided by x. Keep in mind, this is not drawn to scale. So let's actually mark our points for our x values. We have e. So if I were to plug e into our f of x function, so that means um, that's going to equal one divided by e. So that means that's going to be somewhere around here. Then if I plug in pi, that's um, not, we're not really going to plug in pi, but instead we're actually going to make it align with over here with the points that it's actually um, um, touching from our graph, such that we actually form a nice little rectangle over here with our axis, our coordinates over here. They mean say axis. So of course this is at e is zero, and then this is pi at zero, and then this is over here is going to be, um, what is it, e, to, e at one over e, and then same thing for over here, this is pi at one um, over e. So. Now we know that the area of a rectangle, so area of just this rectangle over here. So we actually input our um, lengths. So that means what we have is that this is gonna be the difference for the length here. So that means pi subtract e and then multiply by our height, which is gonna be at one divided by e. And then you multiply this out, we have this is gonna be pi minus e and then divided by e. Or if you want to say, you can say pi divided by e minus one, whichever way you wanna put it that. Okay, so now moving further ahead that, now let me actually just um, shade the rectangle over here. And so we also have to consider our area of curve over here. So area of curve, we know that we actually just simply just take the integral from our integral from e to pi of our function one divided by x. So e and then pi one divided by x. So of course we know that that's actually just gonna be the natural log of x. Um, calculate at the points for pi and e. And then what we have is that if I just plug in e, that means that's just gonna be one. So now I have ln of pi and then subtract one. Okay, and then also to note that, of course, if you're studying something with the Riemann sums, we have that the upper approximations in terms of the rectangles, for example, is gonna be a lot bigger than it is you're um, calculating the original area underneath the curve. So with that being the case, so that means that the area of the rectangle is actually just gonna be, uh, it's gonna be bigger, strictly greater than um, area of f of x. So if we put this back together, so that means I have that uh, pi divided by e minus one is of course gonna be bigger, so greater than ln of pi minus one. N nice enough that if I just add the one to both sides, they'll cancel each other out. So pi divided by e is uh, strictly greater than ln of pi. And then continuing forward that I'll multiply the e to both sides. So that means I have pi is greater than e times ln of pi. And then what I'll do here is not only will I move the e to the front so based on the natural law properties, also at the same time take the e base, not only that it'll actually give us what we want, but I'll also cancel the natural log of that function too. So what that yields us is, so I'm um, taking one step, um, moving one step at a time. So that means pi is greater than ln of, um, what is it? Pi to the power e. And then to finish it off, let me actually put this over here. So. That means that finally, if I just take the e base to both sides, so I have that e to the power of pi is, of course, going to be bigger than pi to the power e. And that actually concludes that proof and concludes this video. Um, two different proofs, one standardized that everyone knows about, and then another one that's actually dealing with the visualization perspective, which I think that's the most interesting part. So, hope you learned something new. I thought that was cool. So yeah, that's uh, pretty cool if you ask me.